I hope that you are enjoying uh, these summer days. Uh, you won't get much sympathy if you complain to me about how hot it's going to be. Now, you will get a lot of sympathy in January if you complain about how cold it is, right? But there is something about summer living. I know for us priests, it means a few less things in the evening, committees and different ministry commitments, which opens the door, the possibility to be in families' homes uh, for dinner. This last night I had, or this last week, I had two different dinners with parishioners. And for me, it's always a great gift, you know, just to see where the family resides, where they're most comfortable. But I was so touched in both cases of being on the receiving end of such loving hospitality. Both of the meals were amazing, but even beyond that, it was the fact that the children, even when they were dismissed from the table, wanted to stay, to just be a part of things. And on my drive home, I was just so struck by the unique uh, ability of hospitality to reach people's hearts. Like it wasn't lost on me that there was effort entailed, that they probably had a full day, but they planned and they executed and they, they organized events for everyone to be there to receive me. And when you're received in that way, you just don't take it for granted. It's a really beautiful thing. It reminded me of something Father John Ferletti used to say when he retired. He moved into his old family home in Como of St. Paul and I was pastor of one of these parishes and got to know him really well. He was very good to me, but he'd have me over and Italian, he could cook, play the piano, gracious host. But he used to put on this retreat for juniors at Creton Durham Hall. Of course, there was prayer and reflection and silence, but on the retreat, he taught them to make uh, ravioli from scratch. And his whole thing when he got to the end is that love is in the food. And he said, if you understand that and then take a small step in faith, you'll never understand the Eucharist in just the same way. That love is in the food. I want to recommend a movie to you is uh, Babette's Feast. It came out in 1987. It actually won an Oscar. It was a, made in Denmark, so it was foreign. But it just really tells the story of how hospitality, loving hospitality, can change and transform hearts. It can soften what's hard in us when we are genuinely received. I wanted to begin with this entry into this very powerful gospel, but I want to give you a little context. For those of you who are listening closely, we took a different step today. You know, the church is on this three-year cycle, year A, B, and C. Year A, we read from Matthew all the way through. Year B, which is this year, St. Mark. And year C, St. Luke. But today, and for the next four Sundays, we have a little interlude from the Gospel of John. And one of the reasons we do that is because this profound miracle that left such an impression on the early church is recorded by all four evangelists. So impressive was it. And in John's Gospel, there's this powerful discourse back and forth, quite lengthy, profound, that happens. So it's going to give us the opportunity for the next month to reflect upon the great gift of the body and blood of Jesus. Second context I want you to know, St. John writing his gospel some years after Jesus ascended is now connecting things. Everything is taking on new light from the death and resurrection of Jesus. So when he tells this miracle, he makes it impossible for the early Christian and for you and I to see it outside of the context of the Eucharist. Why else did he tell us the Passover is at hand? He uses the Greek word reclined three times. You know the other place it's used in the Gospel of John? When they reclined at the Last Supper. He uses the same verbs Jesus will at the Last Supper. He took bread, blessed it, 
and gave it. St. John wants you and I to understand this profound miracle in the mystery of the Eucharist. Profound. You know? It's kind of what happens. We come hungry, and he feeds us, and he wants to satisfy us as nothing else can. And we'll collect the fragments, and we'll place them in the tabernacle, and he remains present with us. But what I want to reflect with you this morning is something that has just fascinated me for about a month, and then here it is again. And it's the context for this whole miracle and the context for the Eucharist, which is divine hospitality. Have the people recline. I know sometimes in our own mind we think, I just got to lug myself and my family to Mass. I just got to get there, which is true. It's a victory sometimes, isn't it? Just to, ha, ah, I'm here. And then, of course, we receive Jesus in Holy Communion. But even more profoundly, He receives us. He receives you. The unique goodness that you are. Tired, joyful, hopeful, afraid. Like He receives you. It's a really beautiful thing, you know? He didn't know everyone personally. It's a crowd of people. The apostles didn't know everyone following him. There are strangers in the midst. Probably even some weirdos, you know? And in the other Gospels, we hear, hey, Lord, we should send these people home to get something to eat. And there's something different in the heart of the Savior. Have the people recline. And by the way, St. John, he's brilliant. He not only cast light forward to the Last Supper, but you know why he tells us there was a lot of grass in that place? You think that this is just a throwaway detail? Until you realize he grew up praying the Psalms. And what's Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures he leads me. He gives me repose. Near restful waters, he leads me to revive my drooping spirit. This is the Eucharist. This is what he wants. You know, sometimes when we think of hospitality, we're a long way from divine hospitality. We think of it as like the entertainment industry, like cruise ships do hospitality, right? No. Or maybe in the church, we say, oh, hospitality? That's donuts and coffee. Come and get it. No. And sometimes in the church, you know what we do? We can wound because we think hospitality is just getting the right words. If we just tell people, you're welcome here, that's enough. No, hospitality is an activity. It's gestures of love. It's who you're becoming. And just to encourage you and me, you know, my sister Maria comes here a lot. Uh, I don't know, now over six years. She'll, she'll come every, you know, a handful of times a year. And she loves coming here. She has a lot of children. The youngest one, I think, is just walking in diapers still, huh? But she always says someone greets her warmly. Someone goes out of their way in our congregation to greet her, and it makes a difference. It affects her whole feel of this place, and we all have our part to play. I wonder if you've ever thought of just having your radar up on a Sunday. I wonder if you've ever thought of like what hospitality is. You know, our world right now says be afraid of the other, be afraid of the stranger, assume the worst. Paint in broad strokes, lock your doors, get security. After all, there are weirdos out there. Fortunately, we're not one of them, huh? Jesus goes against this so strongly, as if we've arrived and no one else has. It's one of the most beautiful things I've seen happening in my time here. 
Just this culture of encounter. There is no hospitality unless you go outside of yourself. Unless you step out of what's comfortable to like engage someone. Unless you're vulnerable, unless you're open to receiving someone. Like someone else has something to teach me about Jesus, about life, about the truth, you know? It's a culture of generosity, you know? Like hospitality isn't just giving something, it's giving myself. It's giving the gentleness of Jesus by listening to others, by anticipating needs, by little gestures of service that go such a long way. It's a culture of mercy. You know what hospitality always assumes? I cherish and embrace what's different about my neighbor. Now I'm fortunate now to live not only with one but two priests. And most often I experience in our living together community I'm strengthened by their example, I'm encouraged, I'm inspired. But every once in a while, I need conversion to exercise hospitality to the men I live with. It begins at home. After all, I am living with two millennials. Thank you for that laughter, that shows some sympathy. And they have to live with me, right? They have to live with me. Like St. Benedict, welcome the stranger as Christ. This is what Jesus does. This is what he does in the Eucharist. He receives you. And unless I was walking with a woman who I admire a lot in spiritual direction, she's from a different part of the country, but she has a lot of gifts, but she just happens to be working with a lot of men. But you know, she holds her own just fine. But she said she got to this place in her week, month, where things were swirling. She felt like, where's my foundation in the Lord? I, I'm, how'd, I get, how'd I drift here? And I feel insecure. And her tendency is just to run from it and work hard. But she just stayed with it, stayed with it. Just came into the Lord's presence, sat in the quiet. And you know what she heard him say? It brings tears to me because it brought tears to her. He, she said, how about you just let me love you in this place? We can't be hospitable to others unless we let Jesus love us where we feel like a burden to ourselves. The things about ourselves that we don't like. I suppose you can receive the Eucharist and just let Jesus like into your, I don't know, the stoop of your interior. <laughs> or you could invite him all the way in without hiding where you feel wounded, where you feel dry, like this is the hot, this is where he wants to go. I want to encourage us towards this continued way of being received by God in Holy Communion, letting him love us in the most intimate place, because only those who have tasted that then say, what do I have to be afraid of to welcome the stranger, to step out of myself in gestures of hospitality? Okay, final thing, if you're still with me. It's pretty profound. How did this miracle happen? I suppose Jesus, I mean, he's Jesus, right? Could he have just, like, snapped his fingers and from nothing there's food? Maybe, I don't know. But he didn't do that. What did he do? It was the boy. <laughs> One boy thought ahead. Five loaves and two fish. Is it too much to say that the mystery of the Eucharist is dependent that we share our very selves? It was an act of sharing. It's how we try to form little children and yet we're still learning it as adults. Like, do I share my time or is it my time? Do I share myself or is it just, I just remain locked in myself? Do I share my resources? It's an act of sharing. And from that, Jesus multiplies. Okay, this is the last thing. Um, just because it's beautiful memory for me, but when I got to go to the Holy Land one time, you can go to the church that marks this miracle. And it was so beautiful because there it is, up on the mountain hill, looking down at the Sea of Galilee. It's very peaceful. But the one picture I took 
was my father who I was with on this pilgrimage, and I were the only ones in this church. And he was up on his knees, and there's a mosaic where there's the five loaves and the two fish. And I just took a picture. This is the man who took me and my siblings to daily mass. This is the man who by his example and authenticity and attractiveness showed me where to go with my hunger. To show me to bring my hunger to Jesus. They ate and they were satisfied. What else is going to fill you? We try so many things. And for me, it was so profound. So today, let yourself be received by Jesus, especially in the part of yourself that you run from. Let him into that. Let him love you. And then at the end of the Mass, when we say, go now in peace, I want to challenge you to think of this virtue of hospitality in creative ways in your own life. Here, when we're together, but out where the Lord has you in mission. And can we be extended in generosity, in mercy, and in a culture of encounter?